With COVID regulations making it difficult to travel round the world to see some beautiful examples of deer and antelope, we took a trip across to Norfolk to visit an exciting new conservation project that's been set up by Edward Pope and Julian Stoyle. story really is my passion for conservation, um, both native species and, and around the world, brought up uh, in amongst nature and uh, decided to do something a bit different and concentrate on uh, some of these species that are not so well known, um, mainly deer and antelope and some bird species like the great bustard. It's sort of evolved as a passion from uh, a very young age. Um, swimming out into the lakes behind uh, to put little posts out for kingfishers and sitting in the bushes with my father watching the kingfishers. We've always been a relatively intensive arable farm but doing a lot of conservation uh, behind the scenes and uh, these lakes you can see are, are created from uh, gravel quarrying. This was monoculture agriculture um, which you know we're evolving as we go along so we're integrating uh, nature uh, with the arable farm, um, still producing crops but over smaller areas. Is, is this a commercial decision or an emotional decision? Um, it's certainly been an emotional decision up until now uh, because we've been doing conservation work and, and genetic work and things without the public, I'm just off my own bat and, and working with Julian Stahl and and his team. What's come about has uh, was the decision to actually um, show people what we're getting up to. Um, so from a commercial point of view, it's more about educating uh, the youngsters and bringing them out into nature and uh, showing, showing the world actually that there's more out there. And, and uh, you know, we had a little nugget of things going on that people were very interested in. Um, so it, it lent itself to opening it up and uh, you know now with people coming through the door um, and coming and staying in holiday lets and that sort of thing and having access in buggies to the reserve it enables the genetic work and the breeding programs and sending animals back to their native countries um, it enables that to happen more readily. I was absolutely terrified when the first people came through the door. Uh, you never quite know whether it's just your passion and would anyone else be interested, would anyone else sort of get the, the concept of it. Um, and actually the feedback has been totally phenomenal. I, I'm, I'm blown away by it. It came about from uh, meeting Julian Stahl and uh, him and I uh, we just chatted and chatted and chatted about deer, antelope, uh, grass and um, conservation and genetic breeding programs and things like that and uh, we put our heads together and, and decided that actually we both had a, a passion for this sort of thing um, and that uh, we had an opportunity to do something. Um, I had uh, a piece of rough ground um, and uh, it, it evolved from there really. It's amazing where a passion can take you. I was at a park um, in Norfolk and Ed rung me up, wanted to do a bit more with, um, with deer and learn a bit more about deer. He'd already done a fair bit of wild stuff but a bit more about the park side. So he came over and, and met me and we just became friends from there really. Um, and then I'd had my own deer at that time and I wanted to do a bit more with him with my deer. Um, and also the conservation side, he was really interested in what I was doing with the zoos and conservation. So um, from there we started helping each other set up uh, some of the rarer species, the, the overflows that we had from the zoos, because I had struggling with space. And that sort of carried on for about five or six years. Um, and I was going into different parks, going in, improving the genetics, uh, the management, the fertility, and then moving on to the next park. And then Ed said, oh, if I ever you know, wanted to do something here, maybe really keen. I mean, the thing is with zoos, and it's not their fault really, that, you know, it's all about bringing in the public. And the wow factor is lions and tigers and elephants and rhinos, these big things. Deer are pretty and they just seem to be fillers really. But in their own right, they're, you know, they're species that are, are dying out in different populations. So um, 
what's happened is they're sterile populations, groups of females, groups of males. Um, they've been there for a long time from the original lot of the zoo started in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are inbred, uh, poor genetics, uh, where deer parks have had other species like fallow and red and more of the common species, but managed really well given a healthy herd. And what I was trying to do is put the zoos and safari parks together with the private sector and show the management of deer parks could really help uh, the zoos and in what they do. And the other thing definitely where zoos, um, not a, a bit of a downfall for them is that they're overpopulating in animals. So they're zero grazing and they're feeding a lot of these animals um, you know, artificial foods, what we're trying to do here, like at Watatunga, is to, I mean, sometimes these animals come from zoos and don't know what grass is. So we try and bring them into this natural environment and teach them what grass is. So that's where the parks could come in, um, bring them back to their more natural environment. Um, and uh, then eventually the potential could be that they could go back to country of origin as well. And it'd be lovely, I think, for the private sector to be part of that uh, programme. And obviously parks have to look at the economics of this and how it's going to benefit them. And I can see long term that uh, potentially if they improve the genetics of these conservation species, then around the world, um, zoos and safari parks or conservation places are going to want those new genetics uh, that the private sector have bred uh, to a higher standard. Um, and I see huge potential in, in deer parks where at the moment they've got a lot of acreage and maybe you know a thousand fallow where they could have 500 fallow uh, but two or three other species that are really being part of um, conservation and, and financially that can work in the venison. I see a lot of deer parks with one or two species where they could have four or five. More interesting for them a lot of these deer parks um, have wedding venues and, and different outlets like that so it actually works for the public because um, yes they're all deer but they look very different. Um, so there's lots of um, financial revenues for the private sector uh, for what we're doing as well. There's a commercial element to uh, some of these conservation species. Um, Barasinga, for example, um, you know, they're, they're a bit different. People want to come and see that. Um, you know, if you've got a stately home with a, a deer park, perhaps just having fallow deer or red deer um, doesn't have that uh, USP anymore. Um, and if you can incorporate it with conservation, these animals can have a value. Um, and actually, you know, if we build up the numbers sufficiently, then there's no reason why a Barasinga, you know, couldn't be a commercial animal. Uh, I think the, you know, the USP element of having different deer species within parks and, and farms is, uh, has got a lot of legs to it that a deer is not just a deer and an antelope is not just an antelope. They're all individual, they, uh, some of them are critically endangered, some of them maybe not, not so much, but they all play a very important role in our ecosystem and without them, we're gonna end up in a, a lot of trouble. So telling people and explaining it to them makes it a little bit more clear. And when people leave, they feel like uh, they've had that chance to connect with nature. A lot of uh, people come and uh, feel like they've learned something not just about the deer and the antelope and the nature here, but also about themselves and how important it is to have these areas um, and have these animals and the wildlife, especially for humans, to just be able to take a step back sometimes and just relax. So using um, deer parks is a, a really good way of being able to uh, expand the numbers of animals we're able to keep. So take for example the Vietnamese seeker. So the Vietnamese seeker is a, a, um, one of the subspecies that's now extinct in the wild. Uh, there's been a lot of hybridizing going on. Um, but if we had a park that said, right, we're prepared to take some of them on and breed them and set up a nice breeding group that we could make sure uh, was managed correctly, had the good genetics in it, and potentially instead of having five or six animals all sort of uh, incorporated into a big area at a zoo, you could then take that, that species out and put them into their own area where they could thrive in a park or a, you know, in a big estate where they had the space got uh, deer and antelope species um, from all over the world and bird species. Um, we've got the great bustard, storks um, and the antelope, uh, roan, lesbok, scimitar and oryx, um, sitatunga and water buffalo and deer species, uh, barasinga, uh, malayan samba, a hog deer, axis deer, um, a whole mass of, of things. Uh, deer and antelope is what we sort of specialise in, but the birds as well. 
both native and non-native. So the uh, oyster catchers, terns, all coming in to nest on our islands in the lakes. Um, and the water buffalo, um, they're used as uh, conservation tools uh, out into wetland areas, um, English nature projects and uh, stewardship schemes uh, for rejuvenating derelict grassland and stagnant waterways. Uh, they get right into the water, uh, wonderful swimmers, um, and in fact they will actually go down uh, like a hippo, uh, walk along the bottom and pop up uh, 20 yards further up. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the pond life or, or the life that comes back um, into these stagnant waterways is phenomenal from uh, putting buffalo in. Thank you.